Well, good morning. You all enjoying the sunshine out there and all of that? You know, I know there's not, you're not more spiritual when it sunshines, but I sure feel that way. You know, it's like, it's just kind of picks up and all of that. And we're in a sermon series we're calling, uh, Your Best You. And last week we talked about, uh, a meaningful life and that we find meaning in our connections with other people, uh, loving and being loved, uh, of adding value to people and having people add value to us. And so meaning happens when we travel through life with people that we love and that people love us and we can share, uh, life together. But, but the truth of the matter, is kind of the meaning that happens in the moment in the day-to-day life is not enough for us. It's not enough to feel like you have partners running through the maze of life to get the cheese at the end. Uh, That's a good thing, and it's much better to do it with people. You'll do it better. You'll find more joy in it. Uh, But we can't help but ask, isn't there more? Then, Then there have to be more to life than simply running the cheese for the cheese better than anybody else. Uh, Does my life have purpose beyond paying the bills and reproducing, or is that all there is? Uh, And we have this sense in our minds, and I I think even people that that are not Christians have this sense that there's something bigger, there's something more important. Uh, And in fact, for those of you that that, that aren't followers of Jesus, uh, this series will really apply to you, and some of the advice I'm going to give you will will apply whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, because we all have this this kind of a sense in life. Uh, And so uh, for most of us, to maximize our lives, we have to sooner or later answer this question. Next slide. Uh, What is my purpose? And when I say that, I don't mean, you know, what is the purpose of life in the grand sense of it? You can climb up and ask a guy on the top of a mountain what the purpose of life, you know. Um, it's not that. And it's not what's the purpose of humanity, that sort of thing. The question is, what is my purpose as opposed to everybody else's? And normally I say, well, you go to God's Word, but I've gone through God's Word several times and Craig Laughlin does not appear anywhere in the Bible. There's no, hey, Craig, do this. And some of you, your names appear like Joshua, but I'm pretty sure God isn't calling you to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. I'm just, I'm just thinking that's not it, you know. And so the question is, is kind of hard for us, okay? Um, so I want to this morning kind of jump into that and kind of answer this in terms of the individual uh, sort of, of question. Uh, and there are two uh, parts of it. Next slide. Uh, purpose comes in two forms, general an individual. So there's a general large sense in which we are all a part of, of the purpose of, of loving God and loving people. When Jesus was asked to boil it all down, he said it comes down to loving God with all that you are and loving the people uh, around you. And because we love God and we love people, then we're involved in his work in the world. We're involved in, in uh, bringing the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. And that means reconciling, bringing people back into right relationship with God. Because they're only going to have their best life when they're in right relationship with God. So we're, we're all a, a part of that. And then within the individual piece of it, uh, there's really two parts to that as well. Next slide. Uh, the first one is, uh, the first purpose for everyone is to be reconciled to God. So if you're here this morning and you haven't entered into personal relationship with God, you haven't been reconciled with God, I want to tell you, if you want your best life, if you want the most satisfying life, the most rewarding life, the life of the most significance, you will find it in reconciliation with God, in personal relationship with Him. And there's some very real reasons for that. The first being, you can be forgiven for the past. And if you're not forgiven for the past, that's like a weight that's around you and drags you back and slows you down. And when in Jesus Christ, he died to forgive us. Wow, we got four people that believe in that. So let's let's try again. I was hoping for a little more than that. Because Jesus Christ died for you, we can be forgiven. Oh, okay, yeah, good. We're, you know, not only that, but he's made you a new creation. The only way you can become the best you is if you're made into this new thing that he intended you from the beginning. And, and you know this in life. I mean, you can go out and, and buy the best car in the world, the fanciest, most expensive car in the world, but it'll never be an airplane, right? And God has intended you to fly. You gotta be transformed into what God wants you to be. And then thirdly, you need to live in sync with the world and with creation. And that's where we talk about being a follower of Jesus, about being a disciple. In fact, I rarely talk about being a Christian because that's kind of a noun and everybody's got their definition of that. I talk about being a follower of Jesus. We live in sync with God's rhythm and how God guides us and, and, and directs us and all of that. And then the second one, this is the really boring down into the individual part, is uh, your individual purpose is to take up your place in God's redemption of the world. 
God has a place for you. It is custom designed for you, okay? And, and he has, wants you to be a part of, of, of God's team. What do we call God's team? Anyone know the name of God's team? It's not Mariners or Seahawks. Oh, that's close. Um, it's the church. That's the name of him. Church. That's the name of God's team. And you know that church is you, not the building, right? Just like where I live is not Laughlin. The Laughlins live in my house, but it's not the Laughlins. It's the Laughlins' house. And, and, and it's the church. We are the church. And, and honestly, he needs us in and, and, and a part of that. And, and honestly, we as the church need you to get in the game and to fill the role that, that's going vacant, that's left undone because, because you're not in it. And, and your most satisfying life, your, your, your purpose in life is found when you, when you do what it is God has designed you to do. Okay? But what I find for most people is they, they don't get this figured out, not because they don't want to, but because they don't have the right information for how to go about doing this. And so I want to answer this question in next slide. Uh, how do I discover and live my purpose? Uh, how do I figure this out? And the good news for us is the Apostle Paul, who probably went through the biggest change of anybody ever in the entire world, talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 1 through 7. Paul not only had to figure out his place on the team, he actually had to change teams because he went from persecuting the church to eventually becoming a great leader of the church. And it was kind of a struggle for him. And so in 1 Corinthians, he kind of writes about this. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, those of you who have been raised in the church know that this is one of the places where one of the lists of the gifts of the Spirit are, right? Anyone, anyone ever read the lists of the gift? You know, your pastor, your preacher, your, all of those sorts of things. And, and those of you who've been raised in the church, we like to jump right to the list so we can figure out which one applies to us, you know, and which one applies to other people. So we think the list is the important part. And there's about seven verses ahead of that that we think is kind of preamble. You know, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get to the list so we can figure this out because we're all kind of bottom lining this whole thing. And I, I want to offer to you that the verses ahead are actually the important verses and the list is really an illustration of what's being talked about in the first seven verses, which is what we're going to talk about. So let's look at verse 1. Verse, uh, uh, First Corinthians 12, 1. Now about gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And that's the important word, uninformed. Uninformed implies that there's a learning curve about gifts of the Spirit. So you may be on the lower end, maybe you're on the upper, maybe you've got it all figured out, it's doing good. Some of you are like, what's a gift of the Spirit? How, what's that talk about? So there's, there's a learning curve in that. Turns out God does not zap you with your purpose in life. Anyone discovered that, you know? We've all discovered it. You know, and so God doesn't send out emails to people. If you're getting emails from God, I have a therapist I can recommend for you, okay? So uh, verse 2, verse uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. And what he's saying here is you need to remember your past. You need to remember we all have a past. Don't be thinking because you got a gift, you're hot stuff, and you got it all together and, and, and all of that. And more than that, he's also saying to them, because you have a past, there's a temptation when we're struggling with this to bring in the old ways of the world. You know, God's not moving fast enough, so I'm going to take care of it. Am I the only one that's ever prayed that prayer? Are you are y'all looking at me like, you know, I mean, there, there's this temptation. And he's saying, be careful. You know where you come from. Verse 3, therefore, I want you to know that my microphone is having trouble. <laughs> I want you to know, that's not what I mean. I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And what was going on in the church of Corinth was they had this sense of who was better and who wasn't good enough. And he's saying to them, all of the gifts are equal, okay? If you confess God, it is good in all of that. And so if you think you have a gift that makes you better than other people, you're confused. Because because you don't. We all have that. All gifts, no gift is better than any other gift. And then he really goes on in this next section, if we can get the next slide. And this is the, this is the important one I kind of want to open up this day. Therefore, uh, uh, there are different gifts, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but... In all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Do you see what the, the key word there is? But. 
yeah, there's this, but remember it's all about God. And so uh, the first word there is is the word gift, uh, and, it, and it carries the idea of certainly of given freely to you, but it also carries the idea of this is not yours. You did not earn your gift. You do not deserve your gift. You didn't get a good gift because you're special or maybe a gift that's not very high profile because God doesn't like you. It is a gift from God and they are all equally valuable. And that's what he's saying to you. Whatever gift you have, it is eternally valuable. And then the second word there is service. And the service word here, I can't even get it into English, but it applies to everything from apostle to serving tables. And it's a word that means like everything in creation, wildly diverse. It's, it's God. God has created all kinds of different gifts and all kinds of different ways. And, and your imagination just can't even begin to understand all the different ways in which God has created service and ways of working for him. And then the last one is it, working there speaks of the outcome. And, and that says that God has all kinds of things he wants done in the world. So he wants people to become followers of Jesus. And, and if you have gifts in evangelism, that's kind of the natural thing. But he doesn't want you to let go of caring for the poor. He says you need to do that too. So other people have that. And so it's not one or the other, it's both. They're outcomes. Or, or, or for some people, like theology is a big deal. Right thinking. And, and that's good, but you can't give up right living. You can't have to think like Jesus, but you also have to be like Jesus. And that, that's what's saying. There's this big picture. This isn't a narrow kind of thing. And then that last word, everyone, the word there for everyone doesn't mean kind of a, a splattering. I'm going to have trouble with this mic. I hold still, which is really hard for me. Okay. It doesn't mean a splattering. It means each person individually without exception. And so you have a gift from God. Okay. And if you think, oh, I don't know, I'm telling you, God says it. And frankly, I trust him more than I trust you. Nothing personal, but he's God, you know. You have a gift from God, okay. And then verse 7. Now to each one of the uh, one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Which means your gift isn't for you, it's for us. And my gift isn't for me, it's for us. You can see these uh, soldiers there carrying a log. How many of you think one of those soldiers could carry that log? Any of you guys ever done this routine? So many of you have been in the military. Uh, the, the only way they carry this log is if they all work together. And that's the idea of verse 7. It all works together uh, for the common good. So here's what I know about how this uh, the purpose and diversity of gifts works in the church. Next slide. God's team has diversity of gifts and unity of mission. Diversity of gifts... Unity of mission. And this is really good for weird people like me because it means I'm a part of the team. Praise God. You know, some of you that laugh, you're weird too, okay? Let's just get over this. You know, the bell curve of most of the people are in the middle and then people are out. I'm out to the edges. And honestly, the reason I want to share this with you is this has been a big deal in my life because it took me a long time to figure out how I fit in the kingdom because I wasn't in the middle. I wasn't like other people. I was different. But I came to value the difference. For instance, how many of you know 300-pound wide receivers? Not so much. How many of you know 180-pound linemen in the NFL? Not so much. It wasn't a matter of their size, though. It's a matter of their function. If you're 300 pounds, you may make a great lineman, but you're going to struggle at wide receiver. And if you're 180 pounds, you may make a great wide receiver, but you're going to get killed on the line, okay? And so it's the difference in gifts. You have to get into the the right sort of place. Uh, And it's just super important that you understand you are on Jesus' team. You're a part of what he's doing. In fact, he calls it the body of Christ, the, the church. And your value is really contained in that image of the body of Christ. I mean, can you imagine if, if parts of your body decided to just quit playing with the rest of your body, you know? I mean, if you had to give up something and, and it, it wouldn't work anymore and buy, which would you choose, your heart or your lungs? Anyone got a choice there? Yeah, we need you. The body of Christ needs you. And, and, and we're all different and we're called to appreciate and, and embrace all of those differences. Because when you start cutting people out, the world gets small really quick, you know, in the body of Christ. We're all different and, and diverse. And, and that's not to say, you know, there are some people in the body of Christ that are, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, take for instance tall people. They are so intimidating. I mean, they kind of tower over you and they're just, you know, tall people, you know, and skinny people. Those people eat the right food and they do all the right stuff. Skinny people are like, I'm not sure about this. And blondes, we all know about blondes. You know, you've heard blondes in church. And redheads, ooh, redheads, wow. You know, I'm not sure. 
and introverts, they don't talk very much. You gotta talk if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus. And women, who understands women, you know? Ah, <laughs> oh, you blew it, guys. <laughs> So here's what the perfect church looks like. It's short, chubby guys with brown hair that are extroverts. Me! First church of me! And this whole message is, no! It's the church of Jesus. With all of the diversity and all of the difference and all of the craziness and all of the weird. God made weird bunch of you should have said amen right there, okay? Because you're as weird as I am, all right? Truth is, nobody can go. Everybody is necessary in the body of Christ. God has chosen you for his team. He wants you to be a part of it. You are essential to the role of the body. And and in God's team, nobody is on the sidelines. Everybody is on the field of play. There is no second string. There is no uh, JV. There is is no bench warmers or, or scrubs. In fact, there's no injured reserves. You don't even get out of it when you think you're out of it. I mean, in the body of Christ, God has a very clear way of telling you that you're no longer on the playing field. We have a little ceremony, I wear black, people talk nice about you, okay? But until that happens, God has a purpose for your life. Everyone is in the game. And and so it's about figuring out what role we play on the field for Christ. Uh, and so here's here's how you can uh, we can get at this. Let's uh, recognize this first and foremost: you are a custom creation by God. You are a custom creation. There's no assembly line. There's no, hey, let's do another one of that guy. You know the old saying that after I was made, they broke the mold. Hate to tell you this, it applies to you too. Applies to all of us. We're all custom created by God, and you are not a mistake. Okay, I'm going to have to take this out of my pocket because it's starting to drive me crazy, so I'm guessing it's driving you crazy. We'll see if it'll sit up here real nice. Now, when I get down from here, I'm probably going to pull that off and it's going to make a loud sign, loud noise. So hang on. Let's see how this works. Okay. So you are, you are custom designed by God. So I want to give you some um, action steps to kind of figure out your custom, custom design. And the first one is this. You need to get to know your design. Okay. God has uniquely wired you up for a particular purpose and you fit in a particular place. And when you get in that place, you will do really well. When you're not in that place, you won't do very well. Just like the lineman versus the wide receiver. And you don't automatically understand that. That's why Paul said, I don't want you to be uninformed. You need to go on this learning curve. There's a process for, for figuring this out. But the good news is that God has uniquely equipped you to be successful with your purpose. Let that sink in. You're thinking, I'm not, I don't know how I fit. I don't. God has uniquely equipped you and no one else, you, to be successful with the purpose he has for you. That's pretty cool. You're the one piece in the puzzle that nobody else fits. Only you fit there. And we need you in that. And lots of people struggle and struggle with this because they never take the time to figure it out. And lots of people waste a lot of time with this. And today we are blessed because there's lots of great tools to help us with with this. Uh, Let's. Any of you have taken the Myers-Briggs test? Any of you have done some of that? Some of you have done that. It's a test of your personality. It's a real in-depth. Here's mine. This is you can learn about me. Uh, ENTP is my uh, Myers-Briggs. I'm an extrovert. I know that comes as a surprise to some of you, but I I really am. I'm an extrovert, okay, as opposed to an introvert. I'm intuitive, uh, and that means as as opposed to being a a sensor. I do intuition versus sensing, which means I tend to think about the the future and I tend to see patterns, as opposed to people that tend to be concrete and live in the present, okay? So future makes sense for me. I'm all about that, but it means I have a hard time sometimes in the present, okay? I tend to be thinking versus feeling, although I'm right on the line between between those two. And I tend to be perceiving versus judging, which means I'm flexible and spontaneous, but I tend not to be planned and organized. Would the elder board like to say amen right there? You know, they, they're like, oh, he is not planned and organized. Yes, he's flexible and spontaneous. And, and so that's how God has wired me. And I, I can't change how God has wired me, but I believe that God wants to use me the way he made me. And that's what the Bible says in all of this. So here's another one. Let's do strength finders. Any of you heard of strength finders? 
If you haven't heard of Strength Finders, I really encourage you, buy, encourage you to get this. Buy the book. You take a little test, and it'll give you your top five strengths. The thing that God has wired you up to be strong at. Our, our equipping pastor, Pastor Tim, uh, teaches a class on it. In fact, they're meeting right now. And this can be very helpful. But here's mine. The number, my number one strength is futuristic. So it makes sense that God would call me to come to churches that kind of needed a new vision and a new place. I think a lot about the future, where we're going, what God wants to do with us. I just believe God wants to do something great with us. Well, I've got four or five of you that believe God wants to do something great. The rest of you, it's going to be a long haul, okay? (laughs) So, and my second one is strategic, which means figuring out how to get to that kind of a place. My third one is self-assurance. When I tell you that I do not suffer from low self-esteem, Trust me, my third strength is self-assurance. That means basically I think I'm right all the time. (laughs) My wife almost nodded her head over there, but she didn't quite. Just, yeah, you know, all right? And then the third one is individualization, which means I care a lot about helping people become their very best. And then my my, uh, fifth one is ideation, which means I like the world of ideas, which is how I get to all of my theology piece. And so that's kind of a, a way of how I work and how I understand, and I, I'm just exactly like that. And I believe that God created me intentionally and God created you intentionally. And the more you know about yourself, the better you're going to be able to find how you're wired up for what God wants you to do. So the first thing is figure out how God wired you, all right? Because, you know, if, if, you're, if you get that part wrong, you're in a wrong thing that doesn't match, it's going to be painful, well, I was in seminary, there was a guy, seminary is graduate level theological education, right? It's the far end of what you, to be a pastor. And there was a guy that I went to school with who was a wonderful, great guy. He loved the Lord, but someone had told him along the line that he needed to be a pastor. And his dad was like, you need to be a pastor. And in the breaks between classes, while all of us were talking theology, you know what he was doing? Advanced math problems. And so there's a bunch of us going, Maybe you ought to think about being a mathematician rather than a pastor. And he struggled with it. He eventually was out of it because he didn't understand how he was wired in all of that. So figure out how you're wired. Then the second thing, uh, is, is, next slide, is, uh, is figure out your passion. What do you care about? What really, really matters in your world? Psalm 20, next verse, uh, says... May he give you the desires of your heart and make you make all your plans succeed. And we think desires of our heart in our individualistic word. We think, ooh, I, I desire a car and I desire a house and I desire to be famous. That's not what he's talking about here. When he talks about the desires of your heart, it's fulfilling the passions of your life. The things that really, really, really matter to you that you're like, this just has to to happen this or that can't happen it it's the stuff that 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 you just you you grand purposes in all of that and god has given you a passion about some stuff something you care about and so here's the clarifying question to help you discover your passion next next slide what breaks your heart what is the thing that you just go oh I gotta do something about that. I, I gotta help. We gotta do something uh, about that. We, we just, we have, yeah. For my parents, when they were growing up, they thought God wanted to call them to the mission field. And what just broke their hearts was the, was the physical brokenness they saw in Africa when the missionaries came back with slides. And so they both ended up in medicine. Because what broke their heart was to see people and see children that had half a leg missing and they had diseases and they had all of that. And then even when they stayed in the United States, their passion was to help people to be well physically. And so they went into medicine. I I have known other people uh, that their passion is to to help children learn to read and write because it just broke their heart when they would see people that that couldn't. In my my last church, I had a lady that when she retired, she went into the inner city, which is kind of where the church was located, and tutored inner city kids because it just broke her heart to see these little kids that were so smart, but they had no advantages, and their parents didn't care about education, and and they'd be in fifth and sixth grade, and they couldn't read, and she's like, oh, that's going to make their life so hard, and her passion was to help kids read, and we have teachers, and you're your passion is to help the next generation be successful. And it breaks your heart when you see a kid that has tons of potential, but, but they're missing it because they haven't been taught right. 
What, what's your passion? What, what breaks your heart? I've known people that, 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 uh, to psychological kinds of things and you know, oh, if I could just help them figure this out. Or I had a guy in my church that when he would see families that were constantly struggling financially, he's like, I can help you work this out. He was an accountant and he'd sit down and spend time with families working out their finances and getting them on a budget and, 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 and it just really blessed families because it just broke his heart to, to see that. Some of you, when you see homeless people that are hungry and, and they're in the rain, it just it breaks your heart. You gotta do something about it. It's like, and you're involved in our program that goes down and, and, and feeds the homeless. What breaks your heart? One of the things that breaks my heart is when I see families that are struggling. One of the reasons I'm so passionate about this image of God is, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in family is I just understand that when family is done well, it is life-giving. It will touch all of these other areas. That's one of my passions is, is life. Some, some of you, I know a lady whose passion is adoption because she sees all these kids in the system and all the, the struggle. It's like, we gotta adopt these kids and they've adopted kids and, and they go out and try to get everybody else to adopt kids because it just breaks her heart to, to see all of those kids. What is your passion? What breaks your heart? When you get how you're wired together with what your passion is, it's so powerful. Next slide. Design plus passion equals purpose. You get those two figured out, whatever you do, it will be your purpose in life because those things will drive you forward. It, it means a, a life of living with something that really matters and a, and a purpose for what you're doing. And it may not be at all related to how you make a living. The Apostle Paul made a living making tents, but he became the great theologian of the church. And I want to say this to you. Next slide. You have a personal purpose from God. You have a personal purpose from God. Okay, so now we got to say it. For visitors, I punish my congregation if they don't say amen loud enough by making them go over it. So just hold with me. So let's say this together. You have a personal purpose from God. Now personalize it. I have a personal purpose from God. He has built you and designed you to do something that is important, that is crucial to this world, okay? And I know for some of you, you grew up like I did hearing this, you know, if you get your thing right, you can change the world. You know what I discovered? That's a lie. I cannot change the world. I, I, I spent my life trying to and I never could. But here's what I know for sure. Last slide. You can't change the world, but you can change somebody's world. There's a kid that needs you to get involved in teaching. There's, there, there's a family that needs you to get involved in loving them. There's, there's a, a medical need that, that needs your attention. There is somebody somewhere that needs you to get in the game, to figure out how God has wired you, to figure out what your passion is, and then to live with purpose in this world. And you will be the best you when you do that. When you have that, that, that sense of meaningfulness that comes from loving and being loved and family around you, and then passion for your purpose in life. God loves you so much that he gave you a purpose, that he gave you a plan. We're going to close with a song. We're going to have it up on above. Uh, and it's because it's got some really cool graphics. It's a song we want to introduce to you, teach you. But it's all about the idea that God loves you so much that he made you with purpose and with design. And then we're going to sing it together. Once You can sing along with it on the video as well, those of you that know it. But we want to close with this idea that you are loved so much that God has given you a purpose. He's entrusted to you a part of the kingdom, and he wants you to get about it. Let's, uh, let's sing together.